Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis discussing with leaders in the field of CTO and Complex PCI. Sensei means teacher or master in Japanese. The goal of the Sensei Podcast is to help you learn and improve in CTO and Complex PCI so that you can become the best that you can be and offer your patients the best possible results. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to Sensei Podcast. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Nick Burke from Minneapolis Heart Institute, one of the fathers of City of PCI. Actually, he's the one who recruited me here, so I'm very indebted to him. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be here otherwise, so thanks so much, Nick, and thanks for taking the time today to You're be welcome. with us. You're glad to be here. Um, so, Nick, tell us a little bit about your journey. I know you've been here in Minneapolis where Bridgepoint started, right? Where, right. And you were a big part of that from the yes. very, very beginning. So, how did that come along? Well... You know, it was. Uh, I did actually some of the first animal work uh, with with Bridgepoint, which was later acquired by Boston Scientific. So the the cross boss and the stingray and and whatnot. So I had that opportunity because they, um, the owner of the company, the president of the company, heard that I had an interest in CTO PCI, and I had had an interest in this for quite a while. I saw it as just a large unmet need. You know, why, if somebody comes into your cath lab and they have a 70, 80, or 90% stenosis in their artery, what happens to them? Well, they get a stent. They come into your cath lab with 100% stenosis, and what happens to them? Nothing. They get medications. And it seemed to me a large disconnect that we weren't doing our very best. And the reason that people weren't doing, weren't working on those 100% stenoses was simply because it was hard. It was difficult to do. The success rates were terrible. And our restenosis rates, of course, were quite high. So the original CTO, you know, work was pre-DES era, and the the results were, were really bad. Well, once drug eluting stents came out, it became clear to me that there was a way to keep these arteries open if we could open them. So I got involved with a lot of the original research on a variety of different technologies and techniques, uh, and uh, all of which were abysmal failures. <laughs> Inclu- you know, there were drills and lasers and, and uh, all sorts of things that, that just didn't work. And uh, we couldn't seem to, to really uh, budge that needle. Well, uh, at that same time, uh, it was clear that the Japanese operators had developed some wire-based techniques, uh, particularly the retrograde techniques that were uh, absolutely jaw-dropping. And I heard about this and got involved with it very early. Um, I was not uh, by any means the, 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 fir- uh, the first operator in the U.S. to be doing this. That distinction went to two of our co- close friends, Craig Sorry. Thompson and Bill Lombardi. Um, but I went to Japan and to their CTO summits and saw these amazing techniques that, and good results that these guys could get uh, safely um, with wired-based techniques. That coupled with the new Stingray and Crossboss at the time uh, techniques for anti-grade dissection reentry um, really made me realize that we had a game changer here. And so then we had a couple of different new ways to attack CTOs that we hadn't in the past. And that increased our success rates while keeping our complication rates low, um, low enough to allow us to continue to, to do this for people. So that was sort of my... Uh, initial journey. And obviously, um, I got to be part of some of the initial uh, work. Um, 
obviously with Stingray as it then became uh, published with Fast CTO and things like that, and then uh, the initial conferences that we had of the C- kind of that handful of CTO operators from the U.S. that got together that uh, came up with basically the U.S.-based uh, algorithm of which Manos, uh, you were of course the uh, first author when that was published. Um, well, the brains were the other people, but <laughs> it's good. Yeah, but I'm no, but so you're sure right. You were that. from the very beginning. But, you know, how how did people receive this? Because I assume people were not super excited to have this. They weren't. And um, it was a struggle. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the the patients loved it. And the referring docs loved it too because you made their patients feel better um the other cardiologists were not so sure and yeah there is a little higher rate of complication with cto pci there's no doubt about it you're trying to uh do something you're trying to get through an artery that's closed and has been closed for some time and so there there is a uh, a higher uh, complication rate than there is in standard PCI. And that uh, took a little convincing um, uh, of the other cardiologists to say, you know, in the appropriately selected patient, this is an appropriate thing to do. And it took a while, quite a while, before we really received a critical mass, I think, of CTO operators, before that needle swung. And I, I think now um, the average cardiologist realizes that there's really a place for this. Not that every operator needs to be a CTO operator. Um, that requires a very dedicated uh, uh, skill set. I think any good operator can become a CTO PCI operator. But it requires a real commitment to do that. Um, so it's really been uh, an evolution. And what made you want to go through this? Because it was failures, right? It was difficult, long cases. The cath lab, I'm sure, did not love you doing these long cases. <laughs> so how do you push through that and convince the people to come along with you? Um, you know, it was really that I saw this unmet need that... There are patients out there, yeah, there, there are patients who have an occluded right coronary artery who are asymptomatic. Well, um, you know, those people do well with medical therapy. But there are uh, a significant number of people whose, li- whose lives are really limited or can't take or can't stand or intolerant to uh, beta blockade and long-acting nitrates and things like that whose lifestyle, particularly in the younger people, uh, is really altered significantly because of this. And I saw that there was, like I said, an unmet need for this appropriately selected patient population. And I knew that um, with time and... practice that my success rates would be high enough and my complication rates low enough to justify doing this for that this select this section of the our patients so back then there were no books there were no techniques everything was evolving so there was some stress involved in that how do you deal with the stress of doing something unknown that you weren't sure how you're going to get through the case at the end it was certainly a, a certain amount of trial and error um and a lot of this worked by word of mouth and um we have uh i think a lot of a lot to thank industry for in this regard they also realized there was an unmet need now maybe they were driven for economic reasons but they realized that their products were inadequate to the tasks that we wanted them to perform 
And they also worked very hard to come up with wires and other uh, technologies um, that would enable us to uh, be successful uh, in CTO-based procedures. Uh, Stiffer tips, uh, hydrophilic coatings, uh, uh, tapered tips, better torqueability, uh, what have you, uh, that their that their tools improved. And so I, I credit our partners in industry uh, with a lot of the improvements that we've been able to make. Um, but again, a lot of it was was word of mouth and getting to know other uh, CTO operators and finding out what they were doing, what they had found successful, what they had found safe. Um, And again, you know, there was a core group of CTO operators in the U.S. who got together on a couple of times to discuss, uh, you know, kind of the best uh, algorithmic approach. Um, So it was something that we did that evolved and it was a very exciting time uh to be part of uh something like that um and i was lucky enough to be there in the beginning so I mean, you clearly shaped the way these things were evolved and how they perform today now back today like going back you know 10 years later um, how would you advise people to learn if they're going to start doing this Obviously, going back again and trying everything from scratch, not the best idea. But how do you think things have changed now in terms of training and people learning um, CTO and complex interventions? Well, now we have actually um, CHIP fellowships. And if if you're a young operator and you're really uh, convinced that this is something that, that you want to do and that is the right thing for you to do, I would encourage you to seek out a CHIP fellowship. Uh, That gives you an opportunity to work with uh, some of the masters um, in really complex uh, PCI. Um, Now, there isn't a lot of funding for that. There aren't a lot of those positions available. So the next thing I would strongly suggest that you do is get proctored and mentored. Uh, Find yourself someone who's going to be willing to look at your cases, discuss them with you beforehand, suggest, you know, appropriate routes and how to do it. And there's now uh, a wealth of uh, printed material available. Um, Manos is uh, the author um, of a handbook on CTO PCI, which I strongly recommend uh, for the Initial, for your initial uh, foray into this so that you're, you're learning based on what others who have gone before you have determined to be the safest and most effective uh, ways. Check is in the mail. So, that's <laughs> coming. <laughs> so, so, so Nick, um, in terms of um, uh, the complex PCI world, right? So it's stressful. How do you deal with the stress and how do you deal with radiation and these issues that can be, you know, very concerning? Uh, yeah, that that's uh, tough. The, the radiation one is, uh, I, I like to credit actually the CTO operators with a lot of the push to decrease radiation levels in our cath lab that we use uh, on our regular cases. And again, industry has stepped up as well uh, from the, the um, you know, the providers of the radiation, the x-ray machines uh, have gotten, you know, better machines that have, were able to use uh, less radiation, decreasing our frame rates, you know, shielding and, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, I think that that's made a huge impact. You learn how not to stay on the pedal uh, nearly as much, uh, taking only cinnies, uh when it's important uh, to actually have a cine, uh, floral store, 
um, is uh, a very important uh, modality that I think is underused uh, in the cath lab by a lot of people where you want to document something, but you don't necessarily have to take a full cine to do that. If you've just watched and, and looked with a, uh, a puff for the angiogram or watching the wire advance or what have you. In terms of the stress, um, I, for a long time, uh, I don't know. I, I, I think it's, you know, for some of us, it's, it's a younger person's game. Um, it, uh, it didn't seem to bother me nearly as much as it does now. <laughs> um, it, uh, I had really good uh, avenues outside of work. Uh, for dealing with that, I was a quasi competitive cyclist. Um, I wasn't very fast, but I enjoyed it. And uh, I spent a lot of time uh, on my bicycle and uh, having outside interests, I think, and ways of uh, kind of burning off that excess energy and stress, I think is key. Uh, obviously for me, you know, my family was a big source for that as well. Four kids and a busy family and, and whatnot, uh, you know, made a big difference there. Um, as I've gotten older, I've actually backed off on doing a lot of the real complex things. I've found that the stress of it is difficult, but I was able to do that uh, after recruiting you. <laughs> <laughs> now I see why I'm here, right? <laughs> so you can have quality of life. <laughs> well, that wasn't the original intent, um, but, uh, you know, I had done with the program here at the Minneapolis Heart Institute kind of what I was going to be able to do. And I needed someone to take it to the next level and beyond. And so uh, Manos, who was one of my compatriots in the very beginning, uh, very graciously agreed to come live in this frozen wasteland <laughs> uh, coming up from Texas. Uh, and over time, it became clear that uh, I had left the program in uh, very, very, very competent uh and loving hands so that was good to be able to do well i think you know i think you created all the environment and actually a big part of this is also the the, the personnel right the staff uh, that and they all have you know despite the difficulties they're actually fairly positively inclined you know most of them how did you do that how you were able to that was challenging <laughs> um you know the staff has opinions and a smart cardiologist listens to those opinions because those people are smart and they're experienced. And um, not all of them saw the value of being in a three- to four-hour case uh, that sometimes would, you know, go offline. Um, it was really kind of dogged persistence uh, more than anything. And I found, uh, particularly initially, um, that we were able to s select a couple of people uh, in our lab who had a particular interest in, in participating with CTO-PCI, complex PCI. And at least in the initial days, uh, having them work with us m primarily um, and allowed them to improve their skill sets as well and uh, took care so that there seemed to be a little less complaining. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I think some of them, and you say, very, co very committed and they do a great job and they take it as a pride. Absolutely. Uh, being the cath lab and being those complex cases that they can handle the intensity. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then um, in terms of the um, other things, um, 
like patient referrals, you know, some places are fairly um, conservative, and right. I've seen that in Texas. I'm seeing that here to some extent. How do you deal with that? So building a program requires having a referral source, right? And I've done a phenomenal job. People around the states, uh, in the neighboring states, are sending you patients, and they'd be very confident. How did you nurture this relationship? Um, initially, a lot of that came out of proctoring. Um uh, Doctors who said, you know, I think I want to try starting to do, you know, CTO, PCI, and uh, I would get involved with their program. And I think a good number of them sort of decided over time, well, maybe this isn't for me, but they still saw the value. So serving as a mentor actually uh, makes a difference and improves those referral patterns and then getting out and giving talks obviously uh about the uh about cto pci about complex pci uh was very helpful um and you know working with our partners in industry was also helpful they were a good source and once they realized that i was a, a committed cto uh, operator here, they actually spread the word uh, for me, uh, and that was very helpful. So I was appreciative uh, of that. Actually, I must say, when I, people are calling me, which physician should you go, the best source is your industry, because they're there all the time. They see the case, so they know exactly who is doing what, and right. they're very competent on that. Right. Um, now, coming back on a personal level, um, obviously you've done a lot of work, and you have ways to deal with the stresses that come with it. Uh, what uh, um, keeps you going? Like, is it uh, the intensity of the procedure? Now you said you're in a stage where you're trying to back out. And actually, I must admit, you are one of the few people who wants to, to stop. Most people I've talked to, they say they want to stop, but they're not sure when. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think it's a maturity level, right? People who want to you know, retire their kind of top of their game versus, you know, become 85 and then things right. don't go well. So... And you don't think a phenomenal from people I know you've done the best job on this, being able to assess, you know, what are your needs and what are your desires. How, how did that how did the process go? Well, you know, as I alluded to earlier, I was lucky in that I had um, you know, in that you had joined our practice. And I knew that that need was being met, you know, in in a program that I had developed. So I I felt that you know, kind of what I had started uh, was going to continue and flourish, which is which was important. I think sure. that that had that not been the case, um, I might have felt very differently about stepping back. Uh, I think everybody's a little different uh, in terms of how they decide when to. Uh, Stop practicing, for example. Um, I've decided that I'm the kind of person that um, probably isn't going to practice into his 70s. Um, I have a lot of outside interests that I enjoy and uh, want to be able to enjoy those. Um, part of it, too, was on a, on a personal level. Uh, my father... Um, died uh, of a form of Parkinson's disease uh, at 79. And his last years of his life uh, were not that great. And I started to think, well, what if that happens to me? What if something like that happens to me? I want to, there are things that I want to be able to have done uh, and family that I want to enjoy uh, I'm a new grandfather now, as of, Congratulations. As of <laughs> two weeks ago. Thank you. Uh, and that's obviously changed things a great deal as well. Uh, so it, it's very much an, an individual thing. I think it's imperative that you look critically at the work that you do. And if – because our skills do start to atrophy at some point. You just don't see as well. Your feel and your touch changes a little bit. And that's, and that's 
going to be different for everybody. Um, and you need to very critically continue to follow your results. Am I being successful? Uh, am I, is my complication rate acceptable? Um, and assuming that that is still the case, if you do that honestly, um, and I think that's one of the, the best lessons that, that we learned in CTO PCI was really, really critical self-appraisal and being honest in your self-assessment. Um, but assuming that your skills are still where they need to be, if you're enjoying it and it's giving you pleasure and joy, by all means continue to do that. But if it's not, then maybe it's time for you to turn it over. Um, for those of us that have developed significant programs in referral bases, uh, it's important to find uh, a replacement, though. And whether that be bringing somebody on and training them yourself um, or recruiting you know, someone who's got an established track record that may be looking for another opportunity uh, in their uh, professional career, um, but I think it's it was important to me to have the work continue. Well, I think essentially it's planning, right? I mean, you'll be planning this, and uh, you created the program, but also you had your other interests, because many people I talk to don't necessarily have, they're so focused on their work, they don't have outside activities, so then right. they feel kind of empty if they don't do what they're trained to do. But also, as you say, to feel that the program isn't going to fall apart and people will, the patients will get their needs met. Right. Um, so this is a great um, lesson, I guess, for people um, at any stage uh, at any stage in life. Now, do you have uh, what's your favorite book and favorite movie? Oh my God, my favorite book. Um, was probably Anna Karenina, or Pillars of the Earth. I found that to be pretty. Uh, wonderful by Ken Follett, Anna Karenina, obviously by Leo Tolstoy. Favorite movie? I'm not sure that I have a favorite movie. Um, I think the Godfather movies were uh, exceptional. Um, I'm not sure about that one. Well, it's funny, the Godfather keeps on coming up. I don't know why. <laughs> this is your world. Um, and then what excites you most for the future? For the future, it's my family, definitely. Um, and I think in terms of the future of what we do as interventional cardiologists, um, I think uh, it's apparent that we're able to do more and to do it safer than we ever have with uh, ventricular assist devices. Our stents keep getting better. Um, they're more obviously more deliverable and the restenosis rates continue to fall. Um, and I think we'll even get even lower as we get even smaller stent struts. And um, so I, I think that our ability to really help people will continue to evolve, and I think that that's very exciting. And then what are you most proud of from the many things you've done, personally or professionally? Wow, well, I'm most proud of my four kids and uh, the fact that they're all sitting up and taking nourishment, and they all <laughs> pay taxes, and uh, so I'm, very <laughs> I'm, I'm proud of that. Uh, and they're, for the most part, uh, independent. Um, I'm I'm proud of the complex PCI program here at the Minneapolis Heart Institute. Obviously, that I helped start. I, I wasn't the only one doing complex work here by any means. Um, I have uh, very skilled partners um, who uh, can do uh, wonderful uh, work 
on people. I was just the only real CTO PCI uh, operator. Um, but to develop that program and to recruit uh, people like yourself and young operators like Yadr Sandoval, uh, who uh, has just joined us recently, I'm proud to leave what I had labored for so long on. I'm proud to leave that in extraordinarily competent hands. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> you should be careful, I guess. But no, but, but you know, you, you create a phenomenal program, and as you know, things are evolving. But I think the the bases are very strong, and that helps down the future. So if you had to give some advice after all the years of work you've done and met, meeting so many people, doing so many cases, to the personal, people who are starting now, you know, finishing fellowship or early in their city learning curve, what do you think the key things for success for them? The key things for success is, um, you know, get buy-in from your partners. Uh, sit down with them and say, I think this is an unmet need. I think this is something that, that we should do uh, as as a group uh, that uh, I that I'd like to lead this or to do this, and then get a mentor or mentors. Uh, it can be certainly more than one. Go to the CTO meetings. Sit in on the complex uh, sections at Sky and ACC and the like, um, and that's where you where you're going to meet these people. Uh, go to Bill Lombardi's complication course because you will see complications and it's imperative that you know how to handle them. Um, and uh, But get supported. Perfect. Well, Link, again, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for getting me here in the first place. <laughs> and we'll try to keep up with everything you've created. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Sensei Podcast. 